Don't you always? <laughs> well, Secrets of Detective Comics 473, another round. All right, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to another round. It's good to see everyone again. Brought to you by the Another I Round am, Game. Uh, your host, Jeff Johnson, and I'm joined by our crew. There we are. There we all are. Uh, That's Steve better. Jones. That's more egalitarian. Hello. There you go. Uh, myself, Jeff Johnson, and Scott Collins, Shadow Collins. Tonight we are going to be talking about Marshall Rogers and his run on the Batman, specifically one of Scott's favorite issues. Absolutely. I was hoping we were, we were going to be talking about the DreamWorks art of the bad guys. Oh, shit. <laughs> that is actually something we should talk about at some point. Maybe um, that's next week. Yeah. But tonight we're going to be doing uh, some Batman. Scott, so why don't you take it away with the first issue? This is Scott, this is one of your favorite issues. This is one of the issues that you wanted to talk about for a while. And uh, right, since, since we're going to pose it and start it that way. Um, it's fair to say that way. Scott's been incessantly uh, bugging Jeff and I about this since we this started. This is where I first round. saw the beauty of a little story. It was one of those little digest books. Yeah. It's a teeny that, tiny little thing. Is that uh, Jose? I don't know what grocery store or, you know, five and dime place or whatever that I found it. But um, in this tiny little book, which um, actually I think has a, an important part of the story. So it's got a bunch of other stories and stuff in here too, but it mm -hmm. starts with uh, this story and it's all, so it's tiny. It's comparatively, you know, about half the size or whatever, three quarters the right. size of a regular comic book. <clears throat> um, and there's other good stories in here. There's a Neil Adams story and a Don Newton story and all sorts of cool stuff. But um, man, I Marshall love, Rogers I stuff. Go ahead. I love, Don, I love Don Newton stuff when I was a kid. On on he did some he had a very cool interesting take on Batman I thought absolutely um, I mean all the stuff that's in here is really good um, the the Neil Adams story is the Two Face story <clears throat> uh, this whole little uh, cheap book was uh, just chock full of great stuff um, and amongst all those great stuff was this issue of uh, Marshall Rogers and Steve Englehart um, doing their little. Uh, detective run, which is actually really short. Um, the, they only did like six or so issues. Yeah, this is the issue. Um, <clears throat> now, I didn't see this cover on my little reprint, um, but um, uh, seeing all this stuff years later and in different forms, um, it's interesting to me how it translates very differently, but um, also very well in this tiny little format. Um, but we'll get to that. So yeah, this is the cover. This is really cool. This is actually very uh, kind of like complicated cover when I saw it later on. Um, I don't have a lot of these original issues. Um, it's it's a very different cover, which I think speaks to a lot of what Marshall did in here um, during his run. But um, it's kind of an odd cover, too, uh, for when I look at it. Uh, yeah, one of the things I think I liked about that cover, Scott, is um, it's the shadow of the penguin. And I, I mean, I didn't notice his shadow back there. And the, the way Marshall designed the smoke um, and the, the drifting mist to actually is that the shadow, the penguin is smiling. What, um, hey, hey everyone. Oh yeah. Hey Matt, hey Matt, Nick, 1983. Um, what, what year did this one come out, Scott, do you know? Cause you got it in the digest form first, right? Right, I got this probably like around 1980 or something like that. Yeah, 1981. Um, the books originally came out, I believe, in 78. This is some of Marshall's uh, first work. It's not his very first work, or some of which was first work for comic books. He'd been trying for a few years, I was reading, um, to get into comic books. And in fact, this is apparently oh, wow. one of the first things he worked on. Mm. Amazing. He got to work on an Iron Fist story that I think was printed in a magazine format, but it was even, I think it was still with Chris Claremont. Chris Claremont wrote it, yeah. That, uh, oh, wow. Uh, that's I've never so that was in like Deadly Fists of Kung Fu or something like that, like the magazine. Exactly. I got to track that down. That's amazing. It's a really great one. One of the things that um, that I loved about Marshall Rogers' stuff is he was going to be an architect. Yep. And I think that he went to architectural design school um, before he got into comic. And you can always see that his sense of design and shape and balance and almost like creating a home for the drawings, I think, always shines through in his work. 
In fact, that's one of the quotes that I wanted to say on here was um, when he finally did get work in 77, uh, he was showing his work to both Marvel and DC. This quote is um, when he was, uh, Marie Severin and Vince Coletta were um, the two art directors that were um, interested in hiring him finally. He said, that's what got me my first job. It really wasn't the drawing ability as much as my design capabilities. So it was his backgrounds and all those things. But I think part of him learning how to do all that architecture work really put a whole lot of design work into his uh, pages and stuff. And that's part of what actually I think is the major component here for, um, cause as soon as he did this stuff and he got onto Batman, um, his design sense and doing all these things, um, really spotlighted him and quickly he was a fan favorite like within see this work was like within two years or so or a year of him breaking into comic books mm -hmm. and he was winning awards and um it, it was becoming a quick fan favorite um he had started very quickly doing this stuff and i think his design work in all of this um set him apart from the other other guys that's an amazing drawing i mean just the construction on the the scallops or whatever you call them on batman's gloves like yep. they're very structural you know right, right? very solid in there and everything. And then oh, him yeah, doing that kind of stuff where he does crazy stuff with the capes, but then those crazy backgrounds that Marshall could do, which many people at this point were not doing at all. Yeah, his attention to detail, his characters in his backgrounds and his buildings was kind of different. I mean, the he took the time where a lot of other guys just had butter stick buildings or silhouettes. Kevin yep. Wolf agreed. His, I mean, ha being paired with Terry Austin, at the beginning of your career never helped uh, or never hurts as you right. as one of the members of another round can attest um, well i mean i don't know what marshall's pencils look like but i do know if they were anything like my pencils uh terry was doing a lot of work <laughs> trying to get them up even though terry oh, was, was, was definitely influential in these issues too yeah speaking of which maybe we should give a little toast to cherry oh yeah since it's our it's, show it is, it is our show Everyone, I just, sadly, I just have water tonight. Cheers, Terry. I have the equivalent of water to me, vanilla Coke. You know what's funny is if um, if we had a theme in the show, it would actually be we. I think we've done more episodes tangentially about Terry Austin than anything else. <laughs> he keeps popping up. He's he, he was in our X Men. He was in our Doctor Strange. Here he's in yeah. this Batman. Absolutely. He, another yeah, round, everywhere. another round of Terry Austin. Let's see, one, <laughs> yeah. two, three. Is this our fourth Terry mention? Uh, I think so. It might be. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, cheers to Terry, Kevin. Um, all right. So um, this issue doesn't spotlight it, but I did want to get to this real quick too. That beyond Neil Adams at this time, who had been uh, reinvigorating Joker and Batman with all sorts of realism mm -hmm. and stuff, um, Marshall was also. Um, he did, did a very famous story with Engelhart um, during this run of Detective, not on this issue we're doing, um, but uh, he was also part of that whole uh, re-spookifying uh, the Joker into being a mm -hmm. really uh, scary character again. Yeah, look how frightening the character is. Yeah. Um, yeah, his underlying structure, I wonder if, if going to architectural school helped him just the way he composed drawings, composed the figure. There's just so much balance and like, it's, it's so solid, his drawings. Uh, they generally are. I mean, there are, there are moments I think in these early issues where you can see that he's still kind of a beginner making maybe some beginner mistakes or something mm -hmm. like that. But, um, and I know that he got to be, um, I followed his career later on to Silver Surfer and other things he done later. And you could tell that his drawing ability uh, kept growing, but um but I think that architectural background for him also informed his figure work. His figure work always felt like it was architecturally solid, that kind of thing, that kind of thinking. It wasn't necessarily that he um, did great shadows or um, realistic effects like a Neil Adams or something like that. But he, he pick and choose uh, uh, the focus of the page and how you would look at it, which was always but great. I, I also think, too, that just when you're – when your structural and perspective and background drawing is that strong, it just really anchors all of your characters into a believable world. You can get away with a, a lot more stylization, or in this case, maybe just as his figures were becoming, you know, you were more forgiving of his figures too, because they still seem to be locked in a very much in a three dimensional world, you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and now we're going to get to uh, the page one. Now, I've got a couple of different versions of page one here. One uh, was from the digital copy we found. 
Um, this is from, I think, a photocopy of my uh, little book here. Okay. That's the one. Yeah. Um, and uh, in this one, he still doesn't get uh, coloring credit uh, like the digital version there. But you can see there's differences in how all that stuff printed and everything. This is much, I think, closer to the original printing of the book, which, again, I don't have. Um, but this is still very much of its time, so I'm betting it's pretty close to the actual printing of the uh, Detective Comics issue. Yeah, this is the digital way. version, but we're also got to mention this stuff in here. This stuff was so popular, the reason I found it later on between this little uh, digest book, they also did a series of books that were called Shadow of the Batman. Uh, they reprinted this whole run, so popular. Wow. Now that coloring, and I'm gonna have, I have a bunch of these in here, this is, now you'll see on the bottom, uh, Marshall got credit for coloring. He recolored this whole series. Fascinating. Um, I don't think I've ever seen Scott go this deep. This is beautiful. We, we, <laughs> really, we, got, we got Scott in his sweet spot. Love it. Yep. Dude, I, I love this issue. This is a whole um, thing for me. Now, wait, there's somewhere in here. I wanted to this show is it. the Shadow Collins show. I thought I had it early on. Maybe I don't. Um he also came up with these amazing covers uh, for this reprint of the Shadow of Batman stuff. And this was um, 1986, so this would have been much more uh, Marshall in his prime. Now I can't find the thing. Did I actually not put that in there right? Dang it. It's a really cool cover with the Penguin that I was showing. But all of these covers on the Shadow of the Batman were front and back covers. Mm. Oh, um, really? Yeah. I, mean, I love issue. I love the little Batman at the top that Marshall put on the cover of the splash page because it's like, it, it reminds me of, um, you yep. know, just when you're so passionate and into the thing, you just want to take control of every little thing. It's like when some artist in Marvel takes over the, the corner box to draw their own version of the, of, the, of the team or something, or Jeff was always seeing little things like that. or. I think in my very brief little career in Wonder at Marvel, I remember I was trying to do stuff like that where I'd be like, oh, okay, who's who's going to be in this next issue of Over the Edge? Let me just draw little drawings of them in the corner, you know, coming up next or whatever. You know, you're just looking for every, you're putting all this extra work for yourself just because you're so excited yeah. about what you're doing. I love that stuff. Scott, do you think this was the first time, I, I mean, I, Bernie Wrightson was the first guy I saw go crazy with the cape, but did Marshall do it before him? I don't think Marshall did it before him, no. Okay. Um, but he was one of them to definitely popularize that. Um, I mean, yeah, and this one, you know, the the top of the panel, like Steve's saying, it's just a little throwaway part of the page. Um, but look at him. He's already set the standard here for himself where he right. just does great, crazy bat capes uh, yeah, throughout this whole uh, story and this whole run of stuff. Much more, yeah, than anybody else that I had seen up to that point, because I hadn't seen Bernie stuff uh, mm -hmm. by this point on Batman. This is the Marshall Rogers equivalent of a Sergio Argonas marginal, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's one of those things to me when uh, he did this so much during the Batman stuff um, that even here on the page one, look at that giant bat cape that's back there. Yeah. And the, it's, like and a the glider. it's like a glider, a functional Ooh. glider. Yeah, it looks like it's a freaking glider, and he just does that whenever he wants to on these pages. Totally artistically motivated. Um, there's no uh, reality-based stuff in there. But uh, I think also this stuff uh, influenced all that later generation of our time, of the Todd McFarlands or anybody else that were doing crazy, crazy cape things. Yeah, Kevin, Kevin says Bernie did it first. Yeah, I wonder um, – I don't know if I – Scott, you've drawn Batman a bunch, Scott – much more than I have. Do you ever feel as though you're trapped by you're trying to make the cape the the proper length, or do you let go of that? No, there's tons of times. Uh, it's almost to me like drawing Hawkman, where you want to try and get in all the wings, but that makes Hawkman smaller in the panel mm -hmm. uh, every time you do it. Um, but uh, I think it's still just once in a while that's the way you got to go with stuff, and that's why I stuck in uh, this shot that you had uploaded. Uh -huh. You know, you made the cape a really cool dynamic piece of this thing and that's one of those things where uh i think marshall was very influential as being one of those guys who's like yeah let the cape take up the whole page man i mean look, I, fun. I was 100 percent doing i mean look at the ears i was doing a marshall rogers batman <laughs> see now i wasn't sure how much marshall influenced you here or a bernie or somebody else with that stuff. well i mean so I, I bernie was always a little um 
too organic for me. Like it, the stuff, his <laughs> cape moved in a way that I didn't understand, but I could understand the sharpness of a Marshall Rogers cape. Absolutely. Yeah, the more the more graphic design of it, I really kind of understand. Bernie did something with the cape where it was almost alive. Right, and he was much more the natural folds and like blowing of the wind, that kind of stuff, which was much mm -hmm. more in a, a similar vein with Neil, um, which could still be a very exciting bat cape and stuff that was going on back there. Um, this is but, such a gr great drawing of Robin, and it also shows that real problematic period in the late seventies and early eighties, and why Nightwing needed to be created because <laughs> when you had a essentially a full grown man running around in a speedo and the level of just powerful leg muscles you had to draw on Robin. It just got to the point where it's like, all right, we need to give this kid some pants. All right, but, but here's where it's going to go into the me as a kid looking at this little digest book or whatnot. Mm -hmm. I loved like that. We were just talking about that shot of Robin and Robin in this thing. I don't think I'd ever really been really aware of Robin before or paid attention to it. I don't, I think this came up before Titans or it maybe it was around that time. And I don't know if I was really a Robin fan at first, but when I saw this issue of Robin in here with Marshall Rogers drawing him, man, Robin's cool in here, man. I mean, he does a great job with Batman and his cape and his ears and the whole thing. Right. But he did a great job with Robin too. It was really, really cool. Well, well it Marshall makes sense. That Go ahead, John. Go ahead, Steve. Well, just all the, all the boy wonder, all the boy sidekick things, it shows that the comic guys at those times, and they're all first invented, they did, there is something to that psychology. like. When you're a kid reading comics, you want to be Batman, but there's something almost realistically aspirational about being Rick Jones or or Dick Grayson or the boy sidekick. It's like you could you could almost believe it would be true. And Jeff sadly knows the story. I know in kindergarten, for me, I remember we were you know me and we were all dressing up as superheroes for Halloween, and I dressed up as Robin because for me it was so real. I'm like, look, I'm a kid. I can't right. dress up as Batman or Superman. That's not realistic. I'm a kid. I have to dress up as Robin. Sorry. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah. either I was sh either I was shooting low from the very beginning, or I was just <laughs> taking it all a little bit too seriously. Well, you, you gotta you gotta become a superhero in stages. First, you gotta be a sidekick, right. <laughs> and you can work your way up. Otherwise, it's just too dangerous. This is my thinking. It was like, look, this is real. I'm going to be a superhero someday. You know? <laughs> right. I can't so be an it's alien. Interesting it's interesting to see here with uh, the, the other coloring they had originally done, which, by the way, there is a credit in here. We should give it out here. Jerry Serp is the original colorist on the book, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and then you go to Marshall's colors, which are much more moodier, um, maybe even muddier, depending on your point of view um, wow. of doing stuff. But he was definitely trying to go for this dark um, pier uh, entrance that they were doing stuff in, in a very foggy Gotham City and all that. Right, sort of desaturated. Yeah, yeah. Um, but like we were saying, that's a great intro shot, especially for Robin, um, since uh, Batman got the cooler uh, shot the last page or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I remember that as a kid thinking that uh, these initial shots, the moodiness of Gotham was cool. But then Robin doing some good old kick butt here. He, he was full in on it. He was cool. Can you pause for just a second on this one? I just like to, um, since it is kind of the Terry Austin show. Yeah. Look at what Terry did with the mist and the fog back there. Yep. Like there's, there's, there's such a um, a rhythm to his, his work. Like, I, you just don't no. see that very often. It works really well. How, how he, it, feels like, it feels like Marshall's doing the sound effects, too. Like the mm. fact that the O is a graphic element and same with the splash and the different stuff. And such a fun thing about comics that you can. Yes. Thank you, Joe. I wanted to mention this too, but we went off that panel, the amazing cut zip and that first shot of Batman and Robin just, yep. just brought back the good old days of cutting my fingers. <laughs> on, it did. Well, with a food and exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> one of the things I think Zipatone went away for a couple of reasons. One, printing changed and the way stuff scanned got changed. And so the use of gray tones um, evolved uh, from a mechanical um, to ca like computer, um, but yep. also it's expensive. Um, and it, depending on how fast you're working can be quite dangerous since you're using an exacto blade <laughs> to put it on. Can we and all I also it think it was just one of those things where it was in fashion for a while and then it fell out of fashion because it had been used. 
Can we all give a shout out to uh, original founding Drink and Draw member Dan Panosian for the way he keeps digitally reworking and zip it tone into his He, does, he gives, his, gives us stuff great. a modern and old school feel to it. There are yeah. people that use it nowadays and they use mold, it very well. Mold, you may just mold, use it on the computer. Mold but school great. is the way some people refer to Dan's stuff. <laughs> sure. Mold school. Mold school. <laughs> Here's more of that smoke, Jeff. Yeah, I love All it. All the fog. It's really beautiful. Yeah, I love the texture and the rhythm of it. I, I'm gonna cont- I'm gonna go out on a limb and say I think Marshall's doing the sound effects. I think you might be I right. I think a lot of it is absolutely. Because like, again, it gets it gets into his design earnest. You know, he's probably laying down <laughs> blue placements and all sorts of stuff. That's part of why Bob Layton has such big biceps is because of how much sibitone he laid down in the seventies. <laughs> right. Yes, well, you do not want to get into a knife fight with Bob Layton. He has a lot of experience with an exacto blade. Exactly. He can cut you. He won't just, he won't just cut you. He'll cut a shape. <laughs> He'll cut a pattern in you. <laughs> Cuts a pattern on you. Um, yeah, so we got a great intro with our characters uh, really kicking butt here on the pier, um, scaring a bunch of hoodlums and stuff like that. And again, like showing how it influenced or possibly influenced Jeff or all of us with trying to play more with the cape and stuff. Mm-hmm. I had also done a Batman story. Oh, yeah. uh, not long ago. Uh, nice. This was colored by Dave McKay, which was uh, really awesome. Um, or you. Yeah, I know. I've been very lucky with that a few times. Just, just, just suffering through being colored by McKay. But this was also like me trying to have those long ears, which are not in fashion these days. <laughs> in fact, there's a couple jobs that I did uh, specifically where uh, after I turned in the job, then they said, please go through the pages and cut down on Batman's ears. Oh, that was editorial. Oh, that's rough. Yeah, I, I think these ones I had the uh, enough uh, leeway, and it was a digital book or something at the time, so we didn't do it. But I know an- another job. I think I pushed it a little farther, so they were almost like Marshall Rogers. And I mm-hmm. love those three foot long bad ears, man. Yeah, <laughs> they're just too cool. Well, they make, uh, they make him yeah. into such a knight, a demon of the night. Yeah, well, funny, it, how, funny how that stuff goes in and out of. You know, it's just. It literally just goes in waves, you know, like whatever the prevailing paradigm is at a time at, for at a certain point, you know. Mm-hmm. Yep. Until people get tired of it and they want something else again. Um, but that was one of the other comments I wanted to make throughout this. And it's going to, to me, it's going to turn up in all, most of the pages. Because of his really long bat ears that uh, Marshall picks, um, and because of a lot of poses and the placements of how he makes his pages and does his things here. That was one of the other magic things that I think uh, worked really well for Marshall in this tiny little book, even as compared to a Don Newton or a Neil Adams where was on here. And they're all great stories, but Marshall's stuff is so graphic in the mm-hmm. way he lays things out, the way he projects his people, even if it's not particularly great drawing um, that he and Terry had finished, um, it still read very well and it could reduce down to this tiny book really well since it was so clean and so graphic it came out really strong in that tiny book as compared to you know the great drawing that neil adams had when it shrunk down that far it may not have played just quite as strongly to me well the the power of composition and overall page design like because you could look at marshall and you could see you could trace you could see a link to tim sale too you know Or, or you know, a tiny bit of Darwin Cook or something too, where it's like, look, it's not necessarily all about anatomical, you know, structural, photorealistic drawing, you know, but like, you you could be, you know, not the greatest at certain things, but if your overall design is is great and holds the eye, it holds the eye, you know. Mm-hmm. Yep. And even this page that isn't that graphic, that uh, one, two, three, four, five, sixth panel of Batman uh, punching that guy because it's got the great uh, bat cape going on there. And because like you pointed out, Steve, that he's doing his own sound effects and everything, it makes it an interesting page. Yeah. There's no way that there's no way that he didn't draw that plow. You know, right. Or the, or the E or that he's just having a great time. Yep. And yeah, all the E's in the background. I saw that later on um, during the Joker issues he did, he would graphically put all the ha ha ha's, wrapping around and through the page and following to wherever Joker was. Even if he was like going out the door in the panel and he was already gone, the mm-hmm. ha ha would have gone out the door with him or something like that. Marshall would do that stuff all the time. It's really neat stuff. Agreed. Let's move along. Um, 
and even on this page uh, with, you know, you're actually just kind of uh, finishing one sequence and then moving on to the other. Um, you've got that panel one where um, it's a little bit soft in here. You'd have to kind of read it, but you see the Batman's giant shadow is being cast on the stone wall right. um, as they're down on the, the edge of the pier or the Gotham River or Bay or whatever that is. Um, but leaving that whole space in the middle so there could be just the type going on. There are those different graphic quality things of where to put stuff and leave stuff open. Um, I thought was always one of those hallmarks of why Marshall became a uh, instant fan favorite. Uh, yeah, but uh, uh, like Joe, I have to say that I did not have as much Marshall in my collection either. It wasn't until you really started talking about this issue that I remembered it and then uh, was able to dig it up and then realize, looking at old images, I'm like, oh, this is in there. It's one of Agre those. those Agreed, Scott, I think. Go ahead, Steve. No, I, or I, I'm, I'm, I'm like you too, Jeff. It never hit me that much, though. I think I had a Batman family, like $1 collection comic from when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. But I think Marshall did a particularly interesting story in which I can't remember if maybe someone that's watching will know. But it, in this, it, in that episode or issue, I'm sorry, I have an animated. Um, it might be this. No, that is beautiful. It's not that. There's um, a Jaguar one and a Man Bat one or something like that that he did in those issues that were, again, look at the graphic quality. You know, it's great. Go ahead, Steve. It's in the same dollar comic that Michael Golden drew the issue where Talia and Rachel Ghoul kidnap Batman and force him to marry uh, Talia on on the on a ship. Um, Michael Golden does this amazing '70s Bat Bruce Wayne with like Robert Redford hair and all this kind of stuff. But then right. I'm almost positive Marshall Rogers did the story, and it's a thing where it's it's more like an illustrated novel, like where yes. There's no word balloons. It's just done, a, you know, like essentially Marshall did illustrations for, a, you know, like a Batman novel that's in that Batman dollar comic. I, I think that's it. actually where this is from mm. or something like mm. that turned into portfolio. But I think a lot of this, because, yeah, that's what you're talking about. I, I remember seeing right. that. I, I had that somewhere um, where it's all separate pieces of artwork that Marshall did and the rest of it was all done in prose. And I think it was Denny O'Neill. I think you're I think you're right. So that was my exposure to him. And I remember thinking that that was pretty special, but I also think I probably got sucked too much into the Michael Golden thing because they were side by side in that, in that little oh, dollar sure. comic. Hard not to. Uh, so one of the things I think is interesting, like uh, him doing his own lettering, putting that into the design of the page. Yep. I don't really do that very often unless it's a, an, an over the top shock a pow, attack a boom kind of thing. But um. I've always loved that, the Howard Chaikin style of adding the lettering as a graphic element and a storytelling device as, as opposed to just lettering. And Marshall definitely did that, took advantage of it. So it's not something that I'm really good at, but I do know some guys love it. No, it can work. And especially if you're looking for something to make your work, you know, pop out differently from someone else. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it could be one of those uh, great tools in your arsenal. And here, I mean, you know, a rather boring page, ultimately, if you think about it, the Penguin is just coming on the stage. He's not really doing a whole lot. He does wind up shining that light. But again, most of the magic is supposed to be happening off the stage. He hears, right. the Penguin hears laughter in the theater. So he thinks it's a Joker out there and looks for it. But he doesn't, he doesn't see him. You just leave it as a spooky thing that you don't know if you if the Joker's there or not. Isn't that uh, weird? It's, it's about the Joker, but the Joker's not on the page. I know. Well, it, well, and they're, it's like, it's as if, you know, he and it, this is Englehart, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. It's, it's like they're trying to build tension and build up over giving the appearance of the Joker more power. And so, for, so the first thing you can do is just like Orson Welles and the third man is not show the person that you're trying to show, you know? Right. Absolutely. It's just like in Troy and Galactus, you put a whole issue beforehand before Galactus steps on the stage. Right. One of the things I think is really great about this issue, too, and, and particularly this run, the Englehart uh, Rogers run, is the the issues themselves are, are detective stories. Like, we don't really know what's yes. going on in this issue. It's it's a mystery to be solved. And I love that era of that. I love that particular style of Batman. Absolutely. Uh, that was one of the things that got me as a kid, too, besides 
uh, all of Marshall's little techniques and graphics and all this kind of stuff that's going on here um, is that, yeah, we wind up doing this thing where Penguin winds up giving us clues and Batman and Robin are trying to figure out what it means and how they're going to catch him and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I was totally gung-ho on that stuff as a kid. I thought that was great. Uh, but the, uh, this top panel here with Penguin, not only is it great because he's pushing the uh, – uh, curtain aside and it's breaking the panel border with that simple action those kind of things but even that other hand where he just has that one finger up again mm -hmm. i don't want to be harshing on it because um this is marshall breaking in around when you guys uh like us uh when we broke in he was only like 28 or 27 i think at this age when he was doing these issues for all the the fan favorite that it got him so mm -hmm. that top uh, penguin hand where he just has the one finger up and the one uh, thumb out it's not necessarily the greatest hand in the world of that uh, gesture or whatnot, or even that penguin face. But one of the things, the quality that I like about his work in all of this, even if you count those things as uh, early mistakes or missteps or learning pieces or whatever, it's a graphic that it reads. Even if it isn't drawn great, it's either placed well, uh, like even him holding the umbrella and using the umbrella there to push the uh, curtain. Mm -hmm. It's drawn well enough that you get the simple basic of what the idea is. And that's where I think a lot of our storytellers from our childhood anyway, even the Perez or Byrne or those kind of guys, you could spend time looking at what they drew for a long time, but the real power of what they drew is that you got it in a second. Mm -hmm. You got the idea, you got the pose, you got the emotional content, whatever's going on, the storytelling moment, the ambiance, whatever. You got it quickly so you could read the balloon, look at the panel, move on to the next one, figure that one out, move on to the next one, move on to the next one. So you could really just almost speed through it on some level and disappear into the story. You were moving as fast as your mind could keep up with the images. Look at all that texture in that second panel that the Terry is more yeah. sure you're putting in the background. Emotional content. <laughs> Don't look at the finger. Oops, that's the next page. All right. Or you'll miss all that heavenly glory. <laughs> anyway, um, and then here, even on the next page, that finishes the, the Joker thing that we were talking about. Mm -hmm. That panel uh, panel or two is this Penguin going, i got to get out of here. <laughs> the Joker's in here somewhere. Yeah, I'm not going to risk this. There's no way. Yeah. That guy's crazy. Yeah, which is super cool, the way that they're developing all that stuff and handling it all. Right. Yeah, even the other supervillains uh, were scared of the Joker. Absolutely. Robin squatting in the back again when you think about him as a pretty much an adult at this point you're like just sit in a chair Robin <laughs> <laughs> stand up this thing that's strange about a grown man squatting on a, a desk except he would have done it at a storytelling point that was their entrance into the room of mm. course of course that's why he would have done it but I know what you're saying Steve I agree with you I know what you're doing but it, but again look at the layout of this page after the Great. third panel you have that center stack of four, five, and six of a little vertical vertical stack in the middle of a page. Mm -hmm. No one did that back then. No one hardly well, does that now. Again, it's such the fun thing about comics where you can, you know, you can cram an enormous amount of information into just a sliver of artwork. You know, absolutely. Panel four, panel seven. You know. Well, look how much. I mean, I'm very curious. Do you guys know if Steve Englehart was writing full script or if he was scripting after Marshall drew stuff? Because Marshall seems to be leaving a lot of room and taking into account in his designs how much dialogue and text there is. Good, good point. I'm guessing since Englehart came from Marvel at this point, he was doing plot because that's one of the things about this is that I doubt that somebody like Englehart would say that he would ask for panel four, that it's just the headlights of the Gotham news truck. And panel mm. five is the, the paper being thrown out. And then panel six, you see the, you know, the headline of the paper, you know, that's very specific doing kind of stuff like that. That to me would be an artist where the, the writer would have said, the truck comes along, it drops off the paper, and then you see what it is. And then it's up to, does the artist want to do that in one panel? Does he do it in two? Does he, mm. you know, um, it's, con it's conceivable, though, I could see an, a writer, as they transition a little bit out of Marvel style, that they might do like a plot, you know, plot per page, but write in the dialogue, mm -hmm. you know, so that you would get the, the, you know, the beginning of the idea of what maybe characters, you wanted the characters to say. Oh, that tiny Robin figure. 
Itsy Bitsy Robin. Right. So good. So much great stuff in all this thing. Yeah. So now we've we've transitioned to the museum. This is part of the, the Melee Penguin, the title of the story and everything that um, there's this uh, famous or, or um, highly sought after uh, artifact, a uh, statue that is of course going to get robbed in this issue. We have to figure out how he's going to rob it, what's going to do. And we spend the, the time with like the, the 007 stuff, seeing the technical cool stuff going on that they have uh, early issues protecting it. Yeah. And even that little detail on panel two of, do you have the close-up? Yeah. Um, where uh, they talk about the fact that the glass surrounding the penguin statue is a uh, an enlarging glass. Mm -hmm. so yeah. It's a magnifying exactly. glass. So then, look, Marshall actually put it in the drawing. So yeah. the yeah. Batman and the guy are bigger than they actually are in the panel in the background. And the, and the black and the magnifying become zip, whereas Robin's, you know, in a full black. Yeah, that's some really thoughtful design. One of the things I thought was really interesting about this scene is he talks about that the cameras would be too expensive. <laughs> yeah, we're down to here that he's like, cameras? Yeah, it's finally... Isn't, isn't like, that funny how these comics are, they're time capsules in a way. Actually, I think of that as very uh, advanced for its time. I would have thought that would have been an 80s kind of back and forth of a thing you know, relating to that, well, there's a budget involved with the security and we can mm -hmm. only have this much. I don't think of that as a 70s or a 60s uh, thing that was in comic books. So I think this is actually a little bit ahead of time because it, it smacks to me of like the realism of um, who was the guy rich dealing with the Avengers and that you can only have so many and, you know, yeah. with regulations of the government, that kind of thing. Though that's um, that's late 70s, very early 80s, Peter. Yeah, Peter yeah, yeah. yeah. One of the things I think is really fun about this era of Batman is in this issue in particular is just how much everybody is comfortable with the man walking around in a Batman costume. <laughs> it does not seem to bother anyone even a little bit. They don't blink an eye. Although in the beginning of this issue, they talk about the fact that um, the mayor of Gotham at this point, Rupert Thorne, which we'll see in a little bit, um, he had actually just in the previous issue or two, I guess at the beginning of the Engelhart run, um, had pushed some sort of legislation through. I think Batman's actually illegal at this point. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, even Robin makes a comment here somewhere along here was just like, well, everybody's still dealing with you like normal Batman, even though you're illegal. It's not like everybody's calling the cops on you. <laughs> uh, Cut to Robin uh, calling the cops. Right, right. Ah, uh, the old Bruce Wayne penthouse. I, I like that 70s era with a giant tree inside the house. Yeah, that was cool. It's a great time. Yeah. Eco -friendly. And there's a real of them of them going home after their little, you know, nightly prowl or whatever they're doing. They got to sleep a little bit in the morning. It's all, very, it's, all, it's all a little bit Top Gun with all this. Everyone taking off their shirt and hanging out. <laughs> also, I mean, uh, I don't know about you guys, but uh, it seems like the robe, the man robe, is something is a, is a fashion that has faded. <laughs> you think so? I mean, the fancy collared man rope. Look at that thing. Come on now. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely a, a, a deal of the 70s with the 60s yeah. time frame. Let's go heart to heart. Yeah, hang on a second. I just... <laughs> yeah, Drew. Yeah, I just so Tom heart to heart stuff. There you go. <laughs> Batman, Batman is Tom Jones. Oh, right, exactly. There was some like crossover. Batman definitely looks like the Mego figure after I'd sort of taken part of his mask off and his utility belt and his, and his gloves, you know. But, you know, they make a very important point here about, you know, uh, well, Dick Grayson yeah. going down this hallway and Bruce is going down this one. Yeah. <laughs> they are not going to the same room. No, <laughs> no matter what Dr. Wortham says. Uh, I'll waken you at noon. That's the life right there. <laughs> And again, now we're just doing the monthly kind of great stuff that they were doing back in these days where um, after that little interlude of daytime, whatever they have to do, catch up on some sleep or do some Wayne business or whatever. Um, the the other big thing that they had done, uh, Engelhart had done during this run was they introduced uh, this Silver, Silver Saint Cloud as the girlfriend. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
who was basically the the primer for um, what was her name in the Batman movie? Oh, uh, Chase Meridian. No, no, no. The first one, 80, 1989. Oh, well, that's Vicky Vale. Vicky Vale. They use the name Vicky Vale, but she pretty much acts like Silver St. Cloud through most of this. Uh, I got you. Okay. Because Vicky Vale, mm -hmm. I think, is be is from before Silver St. Cloud. The name she's is. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's from the comics, too. But, yeah, this is about just reminding us all just like in a James Bond film or something like, okay, look, Bruce likes the ladies, guys. Don't get the uh, – don't get – but you even get that great last panel here. We'll do a close up on it with uh, <laughs> Dick Grayson. Woo -wee! Woo -wee! <laughs> I mean, Bruce Wayne rocking the, sw the sweater vest. Oh, that that haircut that Dick has there at the end. <laughs> that, 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 Jeff, you, Jeff, you had that hairstyle before. I did. I did. Before I had the that haircut. <laughs> before the army, that was your hairstyle. I have oh, photographic evidence. Another <laughs> round of bands. I'll bring it in. Oh, no, 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 please don't. And look yeah. at his uh, wrist, uh, wristbands or bracelets or whatever he's got on there. Oh, yeah. It's very fashionable. Kind of a hip dude. One of the things I love about um, that middle panel there is just how much, like, we get Dick's hand, the turning of the, the knob, also great shadow work, zip done by Terry, and then just the shape of that uh, that green square pulling it all together. Yep. A lot of, lot of really great uh, Marshall putting things in the extreme foreground. Mm -hmm. You know, like the, in the previous shot, there was one with the uh, guy smoking the pipe way in the foreground while there was other elements in the background, you know. Exactly. But even here with all this stuff, look at the body language and look at the, the even the facial language and all that stuff. None of this stuff is drawn as well as Neil could draw it. But... It all works. Look at the, in the first panel there that uh, Bruce is cupping her chin, mm -hmm. and they're all they're they're uh, dealing with each other very affectionately. The body language on Bruce in that second panel, the way he's leaning in over her in the bed and everything, yeah, it's great posing. It's really no, I think great. You're right. I think you're right, Scott. It's like when you start to break it down. There, yes, you can really kind of take apart the drawing, but the but the gestures and the silhouettes just completely and totally read. You yep. Know? They totally work. Now, dudes, this, this is was a cape, a this is a cape extravaganza. Oh my lord! When I was, I've copied that it's second wrong. panel. Like you guys have talked about the Doc Strange issue or whatever else that you've worked over again and again and again. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a couple times with with Marshall Rogers stuff on Doctor Strange and on here, man. Oh, I, I half of my drawings in my sketchbook were me trying to do that cape, that pose, which includes Robin there. It's not just Batman. Mm -hmm. Robin's pose on there and his cape and everything is. Awesome. Yeah. Robin's coiled, ready to go. You saw, I saw, I turned to that page in the story. I'm like, oh, I am taking this book home. How much does this thing cost? Robin has calves almost as swollen as dampen oceans. <laughs> Both incredibly oh, strong. There, there you is. go. Wow. Look the interesting thing here between the, the color in this one was that Marshall drew it that that was a sunset, which I guess is what he intended. Mm. Um, but the the dialogue um, and the caption stuff say that it's at nighttime, mm. which is probably the way the real colorist or the first colorist had drawn it the, in blue and white. The attention to detail on that lattice work is unbelievable. Yeah, tons of work there. Yeah, and, and Jerry would do that stuff. Jerry would do that over a, yeah. anybody. Yeah, is that? Yeah, you're right. That's a lattice, not a not a cyclone fence. Whatever it is, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Plus all the Terry texture you get in there. Yeah, even in the sky and those clouds, he put a texture in there. Even when Terry was young, he had such incredible control, and his line had such everything was so distinct and it and had so much flavor. And now this will pale by it, but showing the same thing. Mm. That's me, where I'm just trying to do what I can with Batman, a crazy bat cape, or the ears, or something to it. Um, I did this for one of the coloring book covers that I had done this for Justice League. But that that Batman was just me working as hard as I could trying to do something, you know, half as cool as what Marshall would do. Well, because you got you got the shoulder spikes in there. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if I've ever drawn the shoulder. I don't know if I've ever been able to pull off the shoulder spikes. <laughs> I couldn't do them all the time. I don't think I did it on the other one earlier. 
the one that's a panel from that story. Well, I, like, I mean, I like how you handled them, Seth, because yeah, nope, nope, not there. In the, in the when you were just showing us, you there, there's a structural element to them. You know what I mean? It it doesn't just look like it's a like a design flary thing. It looks like you purposely made it so that there you know there's some kind of built into the cape to make them go up like that. Mm -hmm. Whatever artistic reason you want to give it, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Just me trying as best I can, spin in my plates. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Uh, oh, and this is the rest of that other page. B and R. <laughs> yeah. You got. <laughs> there By is the way, a charm. That, uh, right. There's a, there's a friendly charm to these comics and their relationships, right? Because even though. Even though he's trying to zap him and cut him with his spinning, his yes. spinning umbrella, just B and R, like oh my old friends, B and R. <laughs> I was just saying that same vein. I know this is kind of a Batman thing too, but uh, they did it for these issues, and I love it when they do it. In that third panel, the caption on top, the first word that's in the caption, mm -hmm. the first letter of the word, they would always do in that circle and uh, invert the letter. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that was one of those fun things of comic book stuff. Yeah. Nice touch. One of my favorite moments is coming up, Scott. And I'll tell you why, because I just think it's it's pure comics. Well, there's again with uh, Marshall's coloring um, mm -hmm. in 1986. And this is more the, the 70s coloring, but just with the uh, modern digital print. Mm -hmm. Is this one of them? Yeah, well, so my favorite thing, I mean, I love this issue, particularly that upshot. That upshot, Steve, how many times have I tried to draw that upshot of Robin, that angle? Oh, yeah. yeah. And it never quite pulled it off. It's a hard, hard angle. How much of the ear do you show? How much of the neck do you show any of the eye? Um, it's uh, yeah. I've do, you always connect, do you connect the line of the jaw to the, you know, or... Right. or these are it's all one of those shots. Of super, but my favorite thing in this is the penguin being flying away while holding his umbrella. Have you guys ever hung on by one hand? <laughs> I just don't okay. think, I mean, I just can't believe the most amazing thing in this comic is that the penguin has the wrist strength. <laughs> yeah. to hold up. Tremendous upper body and arm strength. Oh, what a grip. And a sense of priorities. He's still holding on to his hat. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's got style. Well, he had to hold on to it because look at the first panel here. Robin's yeah. knocking it off. Yeah. But right again with the lettering, like you were talking about, Steve. All those Z's. Yeah. You know it's that was the working it out. What's nice about a comic is you can get away with not having the penguin retrieve the hat when he goes off. Your right. brain will allow you to fill in that blank. Mm -hmm. And I love the boarding. You got to show time someone time picking too. up the hat. Yep. So, All right. And uh, Joe pointed out, which we didn't mention, the and was in cursive. Not even. <laughs> no, oh, I, and the B and R. Yeah. Or was it? Was it an ampersand? Oh no, you're right. It wasn't. It is cursive. <laughs> it's in cursive. It's so. It's. I mean, normally that would take. It's so atypical, right? But it's got so much character. That is really weird. M. Snappin is the the credited as letterer. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know who that is or if it just meant that it was the, you know, 12 different guys who had to do it over a weekend or something. Right. So, again, leading to this thing where, you, like I said, uh, Jeff, that it's a detective story and all that, that mm -hmm. he leaves them clues here. He uses those specific words mm -hmm. and they, they let us know as a reader that he's, I think they're highlighted uh, or, or bolded. Um, the pitch roll, bank, all that stuff starts up in here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's great. So you even get that panel that would be so hard to get away with now of Batman and Robin both going, huh? Yeah. Oh, love it. And then we transfer over to Rupert Thorne, the mayor who has made Batman illegal. And that's one of the running um, regular plot points of this whole, just again, six issue arc where they do all this great stuff. Um, uh, uh, we're going to find not in this issue, um, but this is a medium point for Rupert Thorne when um, things are not going to go his way by the end of the story. <laughs> it's, it's one of those stories where, yeah, you really shouldn't mess with Batman because 
his world will bite you before it's over, even if he doesn't sure. do it himself. Because one of the issues after this, Batman actually comes in and threatens him, but Batman isn't the one who actually <laughs> takes care of Rupert Thorne in the end of it all. And again, a little strange interlude here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's me trying to to capture what I think is cool about the Batman. Well, and again, you're you're doing some of that similar stuff where um, there's the designy crosshatch and um, mm. crossbars of the windows or whatnot behind him, that kind of thing. Um, and again, letting a lot of the cape do the magic of the show. That's great. Mm -hmm. Super cool stuff, Johnson. Mm -hmm. And this is where uh, this is this page starts the main plot point that what had happened before this was um, in that middle panel. Um, Hugo Strange had in the issue before this um, taken over actually as Batman for an issue. He captured Batman, which no one had done, mm -hmm. uh, like put him in a room or something, locked him up, pretend he was Batman for an issue. I think he was a bad Batman too, like besmirching the Batman's name or something like that. Um, and in the mix-up of all that or something. Uh, Rupert Thorne, the mayor there, grabbed him up and killed him. Right. So again, it's just tons of stuff happens in these issues. Um, but now well, Rupert Thorne is happening. haunted by the ghost of Hugo Strange. Yeah. In the isn't he being thrown into the water in that barrel? Yes. It's all <laughs> mostly implied. It's never quite said, but yeah, it's supposed to be that Hugo Strange was being thrown after he was already dead, but they were getting rid of the dead body in that barrel on the page mm -hmm. one. Absolutely. These stories were so cool. Yeah, there was a lot going on. Look at this. So one of the things I love about this page is the fourth panel. And um, yeah, just the way he composes a panel, like I would never, and I don't know why, but it just always seemed weird to me to cut a face off like that. But there's, yep. like, you don't need to see the whole face, right? Like that's not what's important. And that composition is tense. And it, um, it's, it's definitely eye-catching and it still worked interesting for, for storytelling because when i saw this as a little book that middle panel with hugo strange's giant ghost head mm -hmm. i didn't notice that the guy had already grabbed him from behind and was holding him mm -hmm. but in that third panel that's right here i totally got that right away that he had grabbed that guy from behind and was holding that you could tell that his arms were pinned mm -hmm. even all the stuff that he cut off i could still understand what was going on right And then Rupert saying, you guys didn't see anything because he just saw that giant ghost and no one else in the room saw anything. Oh, look at that. Look at that brickwork. Yep. And lots of architecture. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, we are on page 12 of the story already. And remember, folks, this was during that uh, mid, uh, late 70s when comics weren't really doing well. This comic book is only 17 pages long. It packed a lot in. Just like a lot of those burn X Men's that we grew up with and other ones, um, they had very few pages to tell this whole story. Mm -hmm. And now we're back to Batman cool stuff. Look at that little sliver of panel one. Yeah. Such an eye catching thing for when you're a little kid grabbing these books. That thing, and then this panel three here of the rope really coming 3D at you, the, the yeah. rope. Really and cool. the, the oh. ring, 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 ring. Like, I, I love his sound effects. That's a weird one, too, because that's actually the um, the alarm of the museum. Mm -hmm. And if I were doing that or if, you know, I thought of doing something like that nowadays, I would have made sure that that sound effect was much louder and in your face so that, um, you know, it was definitely a noise that you couldn't miss kind of a thing. But, but still, I mean, look, look at Robin back there. In that second or third panel. Getting ready to throw his own rope. Yeah, the cape's mm -hmm. flying. <laughs> the whole thing's cool. Such a great time. And then even the graphic of this one, where there's no reason to particularly pull the shot between these three panels, where the first panel, it's tiny figures, and Batman and Robin are coming in the front door. And then the third panel, they're going out the front door and everything. And it works for the storytelling and what Englehart wanted, whatnot, but... Again, it's that graphic quality to me as a kid that that circular door with that green background or whatever it was colored at the time mm -hmm. caught my eye. It made the page interesting. Mm. But 
Look Holy at that. cow. Look at that cape. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that cape just doesn't – he is not fooling around. He no. is following no rules of gravity or structure or – he's just making it go everywhere. <laughs> Which really made him stand out. I mean, it's great to have the dancers in the part of the, sh the, the plot where um, all the dancers are seismically set setting off the alarm in the, mm -hmm. uh, the museum place or whatever. But it is different than stuff like this, where mm -hmm. a lot of people were doing much more of the realistic thing of what a cape would really do. Especially today in comic books, this is really the, the norm of what a lot of people do is play off the reality of it all versus yeah. the absolutely outlandish level of what this does, stuff does that Marshall does on these pages. It's just great. You could also do something like this, Scott, with a cape. Well, maybe you can't. You can't get it in there. Oh, wow. oh yeah, absolutely. Then oh, that's Batman great shot, Steve. Come back. Uh, let's see, Batman commission that I did. Oops, that is from last week. I love that with all the characters in there. That's a great one. Oh, yeah. Great usage. Awesome. Absolutely. Or if you want to go realistic. <laughs> no, but that's cool, too. That's that's, that's great uh, mood effect of his cape on there, especially being different from Superman's and stuff. Yeah. That's part of the magic of it, man. That's Batman. Yeah, definitely having the cape have its, its own personality, I think, is the right move. I also gave him some Adam West mask theory in that one. Where? How do we get the three on the side? Here you go. This one? That's the one. There you go. Resume. Oh, so we skipped over the other page a little bit. Um, just real quick. They, they're dealing with the people, and then they find out that the dancers and the whole thing was being bankrolled by somebody mysterious. So, again, we're dealing with the whole detective thing. That what's going on here? Who would put the money behind this dancing routine that would set off the alarm and make the security uh, not worth it, not working? Robin was watching the dancer walk away. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Again, like, another really? moment. <laughs> I mean, he's a, he's a young man. He is. And she's smelling at him, too. Yeah. And then we cut to them later, and now they're really working on the whole detective thing. Uh, Dick Grayson's really trying to think about it. He's got the whole, you know, fingers, hand on the chin kind of thing. Um, and look at that, even the graphic of the um, the flying geese up ahead in the profile shape of a penguin for crying out loud look at all the cheap things they have to do for that that you have to color it differently so you see the shape right but it all works well it's it definitely the relationship between what is being drawn and what is being said it's the two of them together yeah. gave you more than than them apart absolutely yeah very much working in tandem so this is the fun page where uh, Dick Grayson thinks now with this final note, what's said on the note, and this coin that's included with the note, whatnot, uh, that he's got all figured out. This is the close-up on the note. So again, we're we're being detectives along with uh, Batman and Robin on this whole thing. Mm -hmm. We're trying to figure it out, too, what it all means. Um, and since it's Batman's book and it's not a Teen Titans or something else, uh, Dick comes up with this great scenario of he's figured out what it all means. Right, right, right. And again, we're stuck with that same camera angle, which grabbed my eye as a reader, as a kid, going like, oh, why is he doing that? That's for a specific reason. That catches your uh, attention to it. And Dick Grayson's wrong. Batman's got to have the real trick in here because it's his book. Mm -hmm. Such great stuff. Again, none of this stuff is drawn that well. Uh, you know, a Neil Adams or a Bernie Wrightson or whoever at this time could have drawn those figures and those panels and everything uh, better than Marshall and Terry had done. But it plays, it works, and it just keeps moving along so you're not slowed down by anything. Can you imagine the live action actor wearing that orange pantsuit that <laughs> Bruce is wearing? In the 70s? <laughs> yes. Exactly. <laughs> I think I think we all I think I might have owned that. Maybe only <laughs> Elliot Gould or Michael Moore could have pulled that outfit off. Who is the, the actor no, from the could have 70s uh, Spider-Man show? Get him in there. Yeah. Nicholas, uh... exactly. And here we're going for the ending. Now we've uh, Batman's figured it out, and now we're gonna—he's gonna race to it, and they'll explain the ending of how he's able to catch him and stuff. 
Um, but we're racing to it. He's, you know, the the Batmobile in the background. Where is the, do you have the, yeah, here. Batmobile's racing into the airport. Skirt! So tiny. Very, very. But it still works. I mean, again, even in the tiny format that I had of my little digest book, all of this stuff read brilliantly. It really did. And how old did you say Marshall was at this point, Scott, in his early 20s? Mid-20s, like 26, 28. So I just want to point out that uh, his eyes still worked great. <laughs> yeah, there's that too. <laughs> there's no way. <laughs> I, I, there's no way I could draw that panel now and even see the Batmobile. <laughs> uh, again, and, and doing it very simply, just like you mentioned before, Jeff, with people not being batting an eye about seeing Batman in the store or walking down the street or whatever they're doing. Right. He's there running up the thing. She actually says the the stewardess at this point uh says oh no batman's hijacking the plane so she's got a little bit of tension going on with her but mm -hmm. really for the most part <laughs> there's no big deal here comes batman running down the airplane aisle with a giant freaking cape <laughs> <laughs> did, did Engelhart get batman with the article going again too because in this in this issue he's repeatedly called the batman you know what i mean like Yes. And, and, and that went away for a while, but wasn't Englehart the one that kind of brought that back? I think you're right. I think that's absolutely true. Englehart made a big splash with these. He didn't stick around long. Apparently, Marshall um, stuck around a few issues after Englehart left. And mm -hmm. I don't know the exact story behind uh, Englehart leaving so quickly. But um, but Englehart made a huge impact on these uh, on Batman during this time, a lot of people want it following the lead that he set up during these issues. This stuff is just so much fun. Look at that. I mean, come on. Look at those giant bat ears. Look at that cape that's already way over the, the arm that's opened the, the cockpit door and he's mm -hmm. grabbing uh, Penguin and hauling him out and everything already. That's just such fun stuff. Right. During, yeah, during, and during, this detective area, like Robin, is definitely there to be Dr. Watson. No, you silly fool, Watson. Let me tell you what you've overlooked. Exactly. You, you got to have that foil. Yep. Well, they did have the thing, running thing in the background of this, which they picked up for Titans uh, right after this, because this was like 78. So uh, Teen Titans was like 1980 or 81. Um, but there was that friction between, the growing friction between uh, Bruce Wayne and Dick Grayson. That Agreed. yeah, Grayson did not want to be the boy sidekick who was just playing that Watson role. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you guys, when I saw those ears on that last page, <laughs> no, right? Oh my god, I thought those were the best ears in the world. That was the coolest Batman. Oh, I mean, they are a full <laughs> head tie. Look at them. Nobody's got the balls to draw those now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's true. Uh, and then he goes through and then they explain all the detective work that we did. We we were given all the clues we needed to to begin with to figure it mm -hmm. all out. It was all there for us if we just knew what they were doing. And then still the penguin's even cool in all this. Um, because you know, they're like, oh, but wait, we thought he was gonna steal the thing. And he didn't steal the thing, all these clues are about him. You know, taking over, hijacking this plane. Penguin's like, nah, I stole it two weeks ago, twerp. Yeah. <laughs> Way ahead of the curve. Yep. So Penguin still has cool stuff in here. You know, he did scare off and he got away from Batman and Robin earlier. Um, he was the main focus of trying to do the detective work and follow him and see if he was smart enough to, to catch him and all that stuff. And even here, you know, he got caught, but he still did steal the item. He would have gotten mm -hmm. away with it. Not for those damn meddling kids. Do you think Batman has the best rogues gallery? It's a toss. I mean, it's a toss up between him and Spider Man. I think, but it's, yeah, it's really. I mean, but it's really the two of them are so far out in front of the pack. And then Scott Strange. I mean, Flash really has no business having as good of a rogues gallery as he does in a way. Like I. Just off the top of my head, I think Batman and Spider Man's are ostensibly neck and neck, and you have to make a big argument as to which yeah. one's better. Mm -hmm. You might just Batman might just edge out uh, Spider Man simply because of the Joker, There's you know, a, like being the star quality of the Joker. Right, and then and then I think it's like if the two of them are neck and neck, neck and neck and neck, the Flash is a distant but still very good third. 
you know, and then there's a big distance between everyone else and the Flash. That's Superman's actually got a pretty good rogues gallery too. Um, uh, they're noticeable. It, he may not have as many as Spider-Man or Batman, that's for sure. But well, he he has an amazing arch enemy or nemesis. Mm -hmm. I, oh, I Bizarro like and um, um, what's the? He's got, he's got a good group. Stealer. But as I remember when those guys were doing BTAS, that uh, the Batman the Animated Series, when they switched over to Superman, they were like, oh, this is a little bit thinner to work with over here. You know, right. and they had to create a few new characters and appropriate a few characters. And, you know, like, yeah, I think they helped buff it up. But I don't think I don't think Superman's. I, I mean, it's it's not a bad rogues gallery by any means, but but Batman's I just have always loved. I mean, so it is a tough call because I love so many of Spider Man's villains, but the Batman I do have this very soft spot in my heart for the Penguin. <laughs> I love Penguin too. Yeah. In that little story, that panel that I showed earlier, mm -hmm. um, I created a new villain in there and just kind of kept it all to new stuff as much as I could. But still, I had a cameo of the Penguin. I threw him in there because he's just. <laughs> I think it was just so iconic for a Batman villain. Yeah, he does the Joker and all that other kind of stuff. But um, I think that's one of the reasons why I like this issue too, is that this issue in and of itself is a bit of a, a step out of the path of the big stuff. What Marshall and Engelhart were mainly known uh, for this run was this story. Um, the next one, it's a two-parter, I think, with the Joker, um, with the Joker fish. Um, and this one, all cards, the awards and uh, everything going on, it really was the, the culmination of their run was this giant Joker story. Mm -hmm. um, and look at that, look at that background. Look at that craziness. Look at all that stuff back there. Madness. Well, right. and then by, the, by this point, Marshall's figure drawing has caught up with the rest of his work. And then it's, and then it's all leveled up. You know, like his exactly. figures and everything else leveled up, but then the shit he was already great at leveled up too, so. Yeah. Although this was probably also in the fact that, that um, he probably didn't have to do these on a monthly deadline. These great covers he did for Shadow of the Batman. Oh my God, that it must have taken him a month <laughs> to draw yeah. that background. Yep. To have those yeah. those stairs, the the fire escape in there, mm -hmm. all the yeah. metal bars of it. Oof. It's amazing. Mm. So great stuff. And this is actually part of that story. There is a chase on that fire escape. It's a big part of the story of Batman chasing him on that. So it's not even like he just made something cool for fun's sake. He made it really cool, but it is part of the story. Mm -hmm. And the really cool kiss up there in the sky between uh, Batman and Silver St. Cloud. And it was just, it really was a great series. I think I'd shown this before, but this is one of the things that I want to bring in here as well. Uh, just the design factor, again, of what Marshall brought to all the stories, um, specifically in these Batman ones, but a lot of the stuff he did at this time. That's a great layout for a page to get someone's attention. Well, I wanted to throw in a quote because that has that, that page has some Neil flavor to it. And I wanted, yes. to, I wanted to throw in, um, this is the quote, the first time uh, Marshall Rogers presented his work to Adams, uh, Adams dismissed him. He told me, to give it up and get a real job. <laughs> and then and then it was like but I took it as a challenge. I had to prove what I could do it. Right? So um I Neil was not playing, but Adams rose to the occasion. And again it was probably some of the stuff we talked about that Marshall's drawing ability of his uh, figure work or the realistic nature of his characters, um, all those things might have been those things that Neil had picked on and specifically mm -hmm. said, you need to level up on all these things to be good enough. Um, and while yeah. Marshall was working on all, all of those uh, techniques and um, building himself a better arsenal of how to draw, he had this design sense that uh, I think was a major portion of, uh, like he said in that quote, what got him his initial jobs and his work mm -hmm. and uh, fandom. Well, I think I think a certain young Jeff Johnson got some unencouraging words from a few pros as well as some encouraging ones. You know? I was also told not to quit my day job, <laughs> but I but I did I, you know I did had no other skill. Somebody had to, somebody else had to eat those words later. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank God! Thank God! I, I, had, I had to hear about my bosses at a certain job talk about me that I heard third person behind my back that hmm. said that yeah I was kind of a mess that I really wasn't worth the time of day. Oh, well, now. But sometimes, just like this Marshall thing, and I'm sure that if you uh, also, Jeff, you're just like, oh, I'm going to show you. Well, listen, there's two kinds of people. Um, it, no, no, Joe, it actually, I mean, it worked on us in the fact that the. Um, Fired us up. 
<laughs> yeah, I was like, oh, really? Okay, well, let me show you something. Yeah. So it worked in that regard, but not – if you can be discouraged, then – then you're going to get discouraged. Yeah. There are plenty of places where you can quit anywhere along this way and not make it to getting the job or after having a couple jobs, yeah. you can still get kicked in the teeth again. You could have this job for 10 years and get kicked in the teeth again. You got to be able to take it and keep going. I mean, I'm a very, say, very, you remember Steve, like when we would send stuff in and you would have to wait and like, did your editor get it? Are they going to call you? Did they like the pages? Like even something as simple as that, not getting a phone call can be can be crushing. Absolutely, oh, yeah, no. And that, well, look, and there's it's a very very small percentage of of professional artists for whom there is an insulation of teeth kicking. You know, like mm -hmm. I think of Adam Hughes. There's a very small group of people that like drew one set of samples once, got right. their job, and then then all of their forthcoming work got them every other job, and they never had to pick up a phone or do anything. You know, like generally everybody else has got to hustle. They've got to keep pushing themselves. They got to break old habits and keep trying to learn. Like, you know, there, there's, it's, there, <laughs> you're never done breaking in. in some right. Way. Right. I mean, it, every, your last job is your calling card for your next job. That's just always the way you think about it. And that can be, you know, that can be motivating, but it can also be kind of um, incapacitating. <laughs> Be incapacitating, but I know about you know for you and me, especially for as long as all three of us have lasted in our industries and stuff like that. To me, at times, those kick in the teeth are a good reminder, a good thing of like you know you got to stay in the ring, you gotta you gotta do your push-ups, you gotta do your different things, you gotta look at new artwork that's out there or somebody else that has a new twist or a different mm -hmm. angle on you know Batman's ears being really short and cool this way or really long that way or whatever they're gonna do. Um, you know, I don't think it matters whether it's animation or whatever else. You got to stay sharp. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, that was a that's a great episode, Scott. Well, well let's done. leave on a hug. <laughs> let's leave on a nice happy note for everybody. This is what we all want. Oh yeah, <laughs> the short the short ears, the little short ears. That's all right. They're very friendly ears that way. Yeah, yeah. They're non. It's a non-threatening Batman. You don't want to poke Winnie the Pooh. No, you don't. You certainly Winnie don't. Bear, you got to be nice. <laughs> Bruce and Bruce and Pooh. Oh, that's a good Such one. Such a nice picture. Well, that was All a great right. episode. All right, everybody. Um, Scott, thank you very much. Steve, thank you very much. This was a lot of fun. I'm going to play this little music and everyone check out. Uh, there you go, Scott. What were you drinking, by the way? What was that? Oh, that's a good beer. And Steve, <laughs> classic Coke. Works. Vanilla Coke, all gone. Nice. Good times. All right. Let's. Let's do a little bit of this. A little bit of that. Yeah. Don't forget to check us out in the description below. Follow us, like, and subscribe. We will see you next time. Take it easy, everybody. Good night. Toodaloo.